The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Well, welcome to uh, the continuing saga of what not to do, all right? Uh, <laughs> it's the, today's title is actually The Pitfalls and Character Time Bombs. Uh, believe it or not, I got that title from Jennifer. Pitfalls and Character Time Bombs. What, what would a time bomb be? I mean, it's, it's in there, and it, if the environment or circumstances are just right, it blows up, all right? And it's in you, so guess what? You manifest. And in the olden days, when everybody was so upset about hiding their issues and putting on their Christian face, we used to say, manifestation is good. Because even if it's a negative manifestation, at least it shows you what's wrong. And we've got Jesus in us, who's greater to go and get the solution, right? We are a solution-oriented people, a redemptive orient. Without a redemptive revelation, the people perish. So that doesn't mean your dream, your good idea. Redemptive revelation means those plans and purposes, that destiny that God put inside of every one of you, that you would walk in it and fulfill the purposes of God for your generation. And you can hinder it. Some of the greats hindered all of the purposes that God had for them. Now, uh, David messed up a lot, but yet the book of Acts, he was able to repent. So, so can you. Book of Acts says, David was a man after my own heart who will do all my will. And we go, oh, wait a minute, he messed up a few times. Yeah, but it's covered under the blood through forgiveness and repentance. Therefore, God's erased that from his book. And remember, there is a historical record that we have in our Bible, and the historical record is there for our instruction, for our head. But the heavenly record is down here in your spirit. So you don't forget in your head. I, I used to watch Christians struggle trying to forget. Forgive and forget, they said. Well, that's, that's not totally scriptural in the mental realm. You forgive or you forget is in your spirit. You feel peace. When you've got peace, the blood has cleansed and washed it away. So it's thrown in the sea of forgetfulness in the spirit realm, but your head's going to remember it. And when it remembers it in your head, when you've thoroughly dealt with something through a genuine work of repentance and forgiveness, the absence of the pain is there with the memory. And people avoid memories that keep popping up, when in reality, if you would take it to Jesus, you'd be a lot better off. All right, so pitfalls and character time bombs. We're going to start with Elijah. All right, number one, pitfall. You know, uh, and keep this in mind, uh, this message is for leaders, but I believe that we're as leaders to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. So consider yourself all disciplers, mature Christians, and this is not just for leaders. But if it's for leaders, how much more for you? All right. So Luke 12, 48 also says, For everyone to whom much is given, much will be required. And not many should be teachers, for he who will teach will be judged more strictly than others. So deal with it or be separated from the presence of God. So here's the first story, and that is um, uh, 1 Kings. Elijah had dedicated his entire ministry to fighting the idolatry of Baal worship, which had been introduced into Israel by King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Mm, nice of them. Can you have evildoers in leadership? You certainly can. All right. In chapter 18, he had this huge victory over the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel. And he was later threatened by Jezebel, saying, after he had this tremendous victory, she says, you know, I will, he was utterly discouraged and depressed. 
And he, pray, he even prays that God would take his life, all because of the threat from Jezebel. After this time tomorrow, you're going to be dead too, you know. And he's over there, I've had enough. None of you have ever said this kind of stuff, though, right? I've had enough. Take my life. Oh, it's such martyrs. <laughs> you, won't, you won't let the blood of Jesus cleanse you at the cross, but you go, take my life. You know, now, Jesus already gave his life for you, you know. I'm no better than my father's. I'm a failure. Yeah, I could just see uh, God was up there going, yeah, got to make some failures here. We got too many successful people. So uh, out of these billions and trillions of people, I think I'm going to make some that are, yeah, their identity is going to be a failure. Yeah, that's what I'm going to make them. Right? Isn't that ridiculous? Right. All right. So he ran off into the desert, afraid and depressed. God even sent an angel to minister to you. He will minister to you because there's no temptation except that which is common to man. But there's always a way of escape. There's always a way through it. And, uh, uh, he said, but I've been very zealous for the Lord. I did everything I was. Oh, to sound like every Christian I've ever known at one point or another. I did everything I was supposed to do. Uh-huh. There, there's a part of a problem. Boy, put, make a mental note on that one. I did everything I was supposed to do. And where's the results? You know, he had an anticipation or an expectation that at Mount Carmel, when they killed all of them, uh, them priests, that there would be automatically eradicated and all the problems would be over. You do the same thing, too. Once you see a result, you think, well, now it's all done forever. You know, justice delayed is not justice denied. But more often than not, we are impatient. And we have a preconceived notion of how and when it should be done. And our timing usually isn't God's timing. When he rebuked me as a young pastor, he told me, Dennis, I'm not on Rocky Mountain time, Eastern time, Central time. We're on my time. Oh, okay. That was different than my timetable. I had my life scheduled out in 15 minutes, segments. And people would call on the phone during a segment when I was supposed to have quiet time. God, you know. So, but I want to tell you the story. Uh, uh, Elijah's main pitfall here um, was his expectations, but it was self-pity. So I'm going to give you, and self-pity is something as a pastor I've seen over 40-some years in ministry. Everybody go through it, and some of them handle it properly, some of them don't. But uh, uh, really what God was saying to Elijah was, forget about the, saving the whole nation, Elijah. I just wanted you to do three things. I wanted you to go anoint king, uh, anoint Hazel, king of Aram. Uh, I want you to anoint Jehu, king of Israel, and anoint Elisha to take your place. That's what I wanted you to do. But see, he thought, he interpreted the results of his victory as totally eradicating all problems from the nation. So you can have a false expectation that takes you down. And he went into self-pity. I want to tell you a story uh, when God dealt with me. I, everything through ministry, you know, he trains us. But a lot of times, you I don't know about you, but I learned by doing it wrong first. <laughs> and then it sounds so wise when you have a redemptive solution. Well, that's because you had to get a solution to your situation. But I can still remember when I was in, I can't remember what the source was, but I would, had just started pastoring. I was in a little vacuum cleaner building. And I was in the, in the self-pity thing. Well, God, if this is so important, how come I don't see any result? If God, if this is what you wanted me to do, does that sound like a Christian maybe? I don't know where's the results. I don't see any results. And God, all of a sudden, I had a dream. And it was a God dream, but it was like in cartoon fashion. And I saw the, the devil, red horns, pitchfork, cartoon level. I must have watched too many cartoons and cowboy movies when I was a kid. But the devil handed me a shovel. And on the shovel was a nameplate, self-pity. And the devil handed me the shovel, and I'm digging a depression. God says, and therein, and the devil was laughing because he didn't have to do nothing. Self-pity, you doing it all by yourself. You're digging the hole of a depression which will later become the tomb 
for you to encapsulate, be encapsulated in. And so when I saw that, it triggered something that always bothered me with my old cowboy western movies growing up as a kid. When I was growing up as a kid, the, the, the good guy would get captured by the bad guy, and the bad guy would point his gun at him and say, here's a shovel, dig your grave. And I always got so upset with that. I'm going, it's bad enough the, guy's, the good guy's going to get shot, but he had to dig his own grave. The audacity of evil to do that. And then I saw, well, guess what, Dennis? The vision God gave you, it wasn't the audacity of the devil. He handed you the shovel. You did this one all by yourself. Then you repent properly and you deal with it. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, if I've been engaged in self-pity lately, this is the word of the Lord. I receive forgiveness. I did it. I, uh, the, it's not other people, poor me. It's not God whose circumstances just didn't comply with my likes and my dislikes. I release forgiveness to God if I judged him as not coming through. I release forgiveness to others if I blame them for my condition. And I receive and I welcome forgiveness for self-pity. And I thank you, God, that you've given us a biblical solution. And I'm uh, going to learn from Elijah's mistakes. In Jesus' name, amen. The six downward steps of discouragement, if you look at 1 Kings 19 and Elijah's life, was first, it starts out, and we've covered some of this stuff in previous messages, and I strongly suggest that you really take this stuff to heart. But the six downward steps of discouragement in 1 Kings 19, verses 13 to 17, is it starts with disappointment. Well, that's pretty mild, isn't it? Disappointment. Discouragement. And then from disappointment and discouragement, you start, then it starts to stimulate a little bit of resentment. I don't know who you're mad at. It might be God's self or others, but it starts stirring up a resentment. Then you go into self-pity. Self-pity goes to anger. Anger, now pay attention to this because as a pastor, I've seen this with Christians. I've seen it with leaders. A hard, critical spirit. That's the end result. And what they do is they become a law unto themselves. Blind spots. A law unto themselves. I can remember uh, um, a whole board of governors was trying to straighten out this one leader. 30 of them. And they said, no, really, you've got a blind spot here. Blah, 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 blah. Well... You say, I got a blind spot. I don't see it. God told me not to pay any attention to you people. I've seen that happen. Oh, so 30 quality people are wrong, and you're right. You become a law unto yourself, and then you use the, obviously, you will say, God told me not to listen to you people. You know, uh, I look for fruit when people say God told me, because more often than not, a lot of times when God told you something, you got what you wanted, and you'll even say, I got a piece about it. No, you just got what you wanted, your flesh. That's not peace. Now, I'm the only one left. That's why there's a law unto themselves. And they're in self-delusion. Boy, there's a word for you, self-delusion. What is self-delusion? Well, you, you don't have any spiritual maturity to bounce anything off of. I tell you what, I made lots of mistakes growing up in 40-some years in ministry. But I'll tell you what, I learned a lot from the ones older than me. I paid attention. And, you know, I did save myself from some, <laughs> some goofy mistakes because I heard them tell me how they did it wrong and then how they realized it was wrong and did it right. You know, you really can. It is really wise to surround yourself with mature people and you find out that they don't necessarily think the way you think. Maybe you ought to rethink. Nobody's going to make you do anything. But maybe you ought to rethink if sound, reasonable people 
who are not in your predicament don't think the same way you do, perhaps you ought to take your thinking to the Lord and reevaluate. Most people are a giveaway when they get what they want when they want it is they refuse to bounce it off of anybody. Or if they do bounce it off of any, why are they afraid to bounce it off of leadership or anybody? Because they already know part of them isn't really convinced. They just want to do what they want to do. And sometimes there's a counterfeit to that one too. Sometimes they bounce it off of leadership after the fact. Well, <laughs> that's not humble. After the fact, you already, you already messed up. Bouncing it off leadership after the fact. If you were really, really had a right heart attitude, you'd have bounced it before you made a decision. Oh, okay. Now, so you, you get this cave mentality. And remember, we talked about this before. Almost everybody goes through the Syria, I am the only one. Well, you wouldn't understand. Or like one time I was dealing with a guy with some severe sexual issues, and he says, you don't understand. I'm a complicated person. Oh, well, then there's no hope for you. You're complicated. I, I only know how to deal with uncomplicated people. And same with Jesus. He only knows how to deal with uncomplicated people. If you're really complicated, we can't help you. That's a spirit of pride. And I saw that with my eyes wide open. A humpty dump, like a bald humpty dumpty demon with a condescending look. You don't need that in your life. Humility is rooted in God. Pride is rooted in Satan. It's actually very uncomplicated. You choose. What do you want to be rooted in? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And you know what's interesting? By humility and the fear of the Lord, that psalm something, it's in the psalms. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Everything the carnal flesh is trying to seek after if through the work of the cross you would find a satisfying life. Lucifer, every I will exalt my throne. I will, I will, I will. The big I is the problem. You get cave mentality and it opens to a spirit of error. Do you know that your doctrine can be all right and you can still be in a spirit of error in your character? <clears throat> You can believe all the right stuff and still be wrong in your character. All right. Did I go slow enough, Jennifer? I'm going for the next one. That was the pitfall of Elijah in simple terms. The warning signs were uh, continued criticism. So that's something you can mark down for Elijah. Continued criticism, which makes you the only one that's right. <laughs> you know. Um, all right. Number two, pitfall number two. This was Jeremiah and Ezekiel's problem. Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And uh, rejection and a persecution complex. Jeremiah. God told him, don't be afraid of their faces. Ezekiel. Do not fear them or their words. If God gives you something to do, the fear of man is something you can give into very easily. And uh, the persecution complex. Uh, I can remember um, in the early days of pastoring, uh, we had the prophetic. You know, the prophetic was really introduced around 1980. Bishop Hammond and others really brought it to the forefront. But my church, when I uh, first founded it, was called the Church of the What's Happening Now. That's even what unsaved people used to call it, the Church of the What's Happening But we had flags, dancing, banners, that, and even a lot of Pentecostals turned on you for that, and prophecy. I had a cult researcher who decided to quit researching cults and just attack the church and straighten out the church. I had him for 13 years, and it was the worst of years, and it was the best of years. Do you know, David was persecuted for 17 years by, I think, was a 17, something like that, by Saul. And you know what it does? If you respond to it properly, you don't get into a persecution complex. 
rejection and a persecution complex. I, you know, and I, I saw beautiful, beautiful stories that came out of that, like the time uh, Pastor uh, didn't like the fact that we were doing prophetic ministry in the church, he had eaten the children doing, and he wrote an article about how corrupt this certain certain pastor from this certain church was. Three articles, one a week, and the first one hurt so bad I felt like I got stuck with a spear. I knew he was talking. He didn't put my name in there, but just, you know, it wasn't a big community. You know, it was kind of easy to read between the lines, and I re- I would get kneel down in my office, and I would release forgiveness to him until I had peace. And then I would feel this ache because I looked part one of three. Oh, so I have to wait another whole week for the next article to come out. And I did that. And by the third one, it flowed like out of your belly flowed rivers of living water, only it was flowing freely and there was no interruption, no hesitation after the third week. And years later, years later, we were in a pastor's meeting, and he was a pastor by that time. And in the middle of approximately 30 pastors, he stood up and started sobbing. He said, I was a novice. I thought I knew a lot. And I attacked Dennis Clark years ago. And I attacked him publicly. I'm repenting publicly. And he said, the hardest part, and I believe this is due to handling it properly in the heart. The hardest part was when I'd see him around town, he was always a perfect gentleman to me. That was his hard part. He couldn't handle being treated with some dignity. I didn't want to make him my best friend. I didn't want to hang around him, but I certainly wasn't going to hold any animosity toward him. You've got to see there's more Jesus in them than their sin. Early church has tried to teach that over and over again. You love the sinner, you hate the sin. If you can't make that distinction, you go down the tubes. And persecution and rejection will take you down. And uh, I'm not even going to give you all the examples of how God healed rejection and everything. But I'll tell you what, it got to the point, it's in our other material, but it got to the point that when someone would reject, and and I can feel rejection just like you could feel it it, it hit your spirit. It's like the automatic gut response now is, I just, that's too bad. I'd have loved on you anyway. Instead of getting, oh, me, poor me, I'm being picked on. You know, that persecution complex will not happen. What did he tell Jeremiah? Be not afraid of their faces or I'll confound you in front of them. It'll take you down if you let them get to you. If you let the fear of man get to you, it'll take you down. And there's other stories. Like I said, there's 40-some years of ministry. I could give you a dozen stories for every pitfall. And I don't know how far we're going to get today because there's 11 pitfalls that I'd like to cover. <laughs> I don't think you can handle 11 pit calls today. All right? Just do these. All right? So pitfall number two is rejection and the persecution complex. Uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah were picked on a lot, but ultimately God had to teach them not to get a persecution complex. Persecution exists. Let's face it, right now, even the times we're living in now, uh, Christians in and of itself, there's even some that think they're going to get away with it by watering down the gospel, like then there won't be any persecution. I'll just teach a progressive Christianity where I cut out all the parts that would offend anybody. Yeah, right. You get you too. (laughs) You'll be confounded before them. I'd rather you made a stand for integrity and reality and try to water it down so that you can get by. It isn't about you getting by. Be not afraid of their faces. Stand for something. All right? All right, pitfall number three. Abraham. Abraham got off the track due to family influence. Is family a good thing? Yes, but in 40-some years, I've watched it perverted. I've watched people taking the advice of family, being pressured by family, and in a lot of cases, unsaved family, 
taking the pressures from unsafe family and molding their choices and then saying it's God. When in reality, it's like an unsanctified mercy toward family to where you, 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 you mess up because of family influence. Actually, Abraham did a lot. That was one of his weaknesses. Um, in Genesis 11, verse 31 to chapter 12, verse 4, you can read the story. I'm not going to get into it. But he had pressure from uh, relatives or a sense of obligation. There's a false obligation to where you think you are God to them in family. You are not, they are God's servant, not yours. From the very womb, they belong to God, not to you. You are called to be a steward, not an owner. And uh, th there's volumes in just that statement alone. A steward, not an owner. In other words, you're accountable to God for them, but th there's this sick family thing to where you see it as such a virtue, but it's actually idolatry. You will do in an idolatrous form. Look, at, here's some of the mistakes that Abraham made. First of all, he was told to go out of the Ur of Chaldees. He had to take family with him because of a sense of false obligation. But it hindered what God was trying to do. He hung around and did not go into the promised land that, that God told him at first because he waited in a preset destination before that until his father died. You know how many people I heard, oh, I'll go on the mission field after my kids are grown. The kids are grown, you never went on the mission field. That's a false responsibility, but it sounds so good, me and my kids. Yeah, you and your kids, it's idolatrous. You, you raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You teach them what pleases God, but you're not God to them. And you need to repent of that. There's a, there's a, a, a lot caused division before moving to Sodom. Remember the story? Lot shouldn't have gone in the first place. We have Ishmael and Ishmaelites to this day as a result of that. The root cause there was failing to deal with family in a biblical, heartfelt way. And it was over-responsibility, wrong type of family influence and decision with the maid Hagar. Well, we know how that resulted, right? There's your Ishmael. He was going to help it out, help the family out. Don't let God do it. You do it. You help the family out. You be Jesus to them. Well, good luck with that because that's sin. You see it as a virtue. God sees it as sin. He's looking at your heart. You don't do that for anybody else. You're doing that for yourself, actually, even more than them, out of that sense of responsibility. Family connections can interfere with divine assignments. If you want to write something down under Abraham, family connections. Our fam is family good? I can hear people that have this as a blind spot are getting confused right now. Well, God's not the author of confusion. Family connections can interfere with divine assignments. Family connections can interfere. I've seen more people taken down the, down the path of backsliding from a family member. God told me. Yeah, right. Okay. Can you see that? I'm going to give you a story of that. I had a woman in my church, very gifted, married, but her mother ran the family. I had to have her, yes, you can love your mother, but love releases. Love your mother. I had her in my office to break the soul tie because it was an unhealthy mother relationship to where she was running the husband and the wife both. She broke the soul tie. The minute that soul tie was broken, in my office, the phone rang. Is my daughter there? Takes the phone. Why have you divorced me? She knew in the spirit that evil soul tie was broken. People, you got soul ties and you pretend like it's a virtue. 
It is not a virtue. God wants to deal with these family issues that are not healthy. I can remember another one that uh, uh, it was a cultural thing, but it was like the family, everybody met, all the members met um, at the house. It was like a board meeting. And the head of the house, grandpa, would make the decisions or they would vote. And then they would tell some of the children how they voted and what they needed to do. I don't know about you, but I don't stand for that. I'm responsible for my own choices in my life. I'm not going to vote on it and have family vote on it and tell me what, what, what I should do. Right? I've seen that happen. All right. Family connections can interfere with divine assignments. And sometimes I see this parental inversion thing. You know what I mean, parental inversion? It's like where the child bosses the mom and dad around. And even now it's real trendy <laughs> to not discipline kids. <laughs> well, just this kind of like reminds me of those eggs at the grocery store. These were not done in cages. They were free-range chickens. Well, that's what we need. We need more free-range children running all over, doing whatever they think is best. Yeah. And you know what? That brings us to the fourth. The fourth. Eli the priest. You remember Eli? He mentored young Samuel. Huh? Well, Eli the priest, his pitfall was a spoiled child syndrome. Speaking of spoiled children. Eli was the priest who mentored the prophet Samuel, but he failed to discipline his own sons, Hophni and Phinehas. The summary of their lifestyle is given in the introduction to these three men. Eli's sons were scoundrels. Is that NIV? <laughs> Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. But Eli turned the other way. Did nothing about it. I'm not saying Eli wasn't a man of God. I'm saying Eli did nothing about it. And Eli's sons did not know or regard God. They acted in wicked ways. They brought out of the pot any time there was a sacrifice. They just took whatever they wanted. Uh, it was in contradiction for the law of the priest to do that. They were commanded to eat you know, certain parts, Leviticus 7. Second, Eli's sons were sleeping with women who were dedicated to the service of the tabernacle. Uh, that was against God's law, forbidding adultery. Now, prophet... He, but Eli, listen to me, it wasn't like, oh, well, I didn't know, oh, nobody told me that I had to watch these kids, nobody told me. No, he turned the other way because a prophet came to Eli and revealed that judgment would come upon Eli's sons for these actions. The sign that the judgment was divine was included. What happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. And they did. Soon after this time, Eli's two sons took the Ark of the Covenant to battle against the Philistines. The Israelites were defeated, and judgment befell Eli's sons. Worse, when Eli heard the news, he fell backward from his seat, broke his neck, and died on the same day. The pregnant wife of Phinehas, this is where you hear that term, Ichabod, the pregnant wife of Phineas, one of the sons, heard the news and she went into labor and died while giving birth. The son was named Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed. We've got to take this stuff seriously. And like I'm saying, these are examples in the scripture for our instruction, but I've seen all of these in ministry, every one of them. And I can give you stories of the ones I gave into and how I had to learn to develop it. So don't dismiss this as that doesn't apply to me. If it applied to the greats, there's ways where this can influence you as well. So the spoiled child syndrome, when his sons did wrong, he looked the other way. 
I've done this with uh, true and false spiritual sons and daughters. Um, and one of the things that I've learned was uh, when it comes to dealing with children too, I always look for raising up and mentoring quality leadership. Uh, if I'm hesitant with raising somebody up, it's usually because I saw how they handled no. How do your little children handle no? <laughs> You will see what, what they're able to do just by telling them no. Any form of correction. Tell them no. You know, it's, we have to think, and the church doesn't probably in America as much, but the Bible was written with a Hebrew mindset, not a Greek mindset. The Greek mindset is pretty much a, a committee, programs, government, and then theoretical teaching. Does that sound Greek to you? <laughs> Committees, government. It's, it, it keeps a distance from intimacy. But the Hebrew mindset was family. It, it was <clears throat> accountability to that family. And then, this, then the success of training that is necessary to bring them to the fullness of what their capability is. But you know, how they handle yes or no will determine the mentoring capacity for some people. And the embarrassing one is the ones that fake it and really think, if you've got discernment, discernment is coming from the love of God. People who have blind spots Sometimes they know what their blind spot is, and sometimes they don't, but it's discernible. That would tell me that I would want to bounce certain things off that I take for granted. What's it hurt to bounce it off? Unless you're afraid. If you're afraid to bounce it off, you're already giving me the answer. You're already not sure. You have vested interest somehow. Now, God was angry with, the, uh, with Eli because... Uh, why do you scorn my sacrifice and my offerings? Why do you give your sons more honor than you give me? Why do you give your sons more honor than you give me? And you know what? Oh, but I love my children. <laughs> more than God? Then you've got a serious, serious issue here. <clears throat> and what's, what's even more sad, talk about generational. Samuel was impeccably anointed, wasn't he? It said his prophetic words, not a word, fell to the ground. And yet, as Samuel grew old, now who was he mentored by? Eli. Do you think he could have even been influenced how Eli raised children? He was watching. But it says, as Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel, Joel and Abijah, Abijah his oldest sons. They held court in Beersheba. But they were not like their father. <clears throat> they were greedy for money, and they accepted bribes and perverted justice. There's no guarantee that children go the way of the parents, is there? But that's not an excuse for overlooking any discipline. Makes you wonder if Samuel turned the other way, because that's what he saw even by his mentor. Turned the other way. I don't know. But there's a lesson in there, the spoiled child syndrome. So some of the loving parents are not as loving as you think you are if you're making your children idols. And worse, don't fall into that garbage that's out there now. And it's very prevalent, isn't it? It's all over the place now. Let them grow up without discipline. Let them discover themselves. <coughs> Why would you want to do that? Discover yourself. Hmm? Now, we enough with Eli? You ready for number five? Oh, man. Is this ever going to end? <laughs> Is this preacher going to stop? Moses. Now, these are quality men of women of God, aren't they? And yet, Moses was the overprotective and unsanctified mercy pitfall. Moses, number five. Overprotectiveness and unsanctified mercy. 
I don't know if everybody even knows what unsanctified mercy is. It's when you show mercy when you shouldn't have. Oh, let me buy them another bottle of liquor. It's my duty. They're drunk. I'm going to help them get drunker. That ain't God. <laughs> That's unsanctified mercy. All right. Moses was given a pastoral role to shepherd and lead God's people. He was given the assignment to lead them into the promised land. Hello? He was given the assignment by God to lead them into the promised land. But Moses had a human virtue that became a vice, unsanctified mercy. Now, mercy is a virtue. Unsanctified mercy becomes a vice. He became torn between human mercy and compassion and God's judgment and prophetic purposes. Moses' root problem was being overprotective of his personal flock. Remember, this church here, King of Lecture, you're not my people. You're God's people. But I take my responsibility seriously. But I can only pastor those that have voluntarily submitted to it. If you've got a better plan and you take off and go do your thing. By the way, uh, not everybody leaves the church is offended. More often than not, they have an agenda. I have a piece about it. Okay, you have a piece about it. Where are you going? I don't know. Oh, you don't know where you're going. You just have a piece about, well, why did you ask in the first place, God, can I leave and not go anywhere? And he said, yeah. Why did you even want to ask in the first place? What's in your heart? None of that stuff makes sense, but it sounds so good, God said. All right. <clears throat> so Moses' root problem was that overprotectiveness, that control. And sometimes it's parental inversion. Sometimes it's because the undue, remember we talked about this, or the undue influence of family or friends even unsaved people, influencing you to make a decision and then say, God said. <laughs> All right. So every time uh, Moses, he argued with God. Uh, but you know what? He argued with God to save those children that, uh, that God said needed to die. And he got a little reprieve, but it hurt his destiny. He never entered into the promised land. And eventually, guess what? They all died, just as God said. That generation will not enter in. <laughs> so you didn't really accomplish anything with your unsanctified mercy. Moses himself never entered. The entire new generation went into a promised land. It was 40 years for that to happen. So here's some lessons for unsanctified mercy and overprotectiveness. Our actions can cancel part of our divine destiny. I heard a major leader once say, you know, only 5% actually find their fulfillment in the plans and purposes that God had for them. I don't know where you got that figure, but I know people short-circuit it with their own strange decision-making. God's grace for endurance does not extend beyond the bounds of God's purpose. Okay, for all the merciful people, God's grace does not extend beyond his purposes. If God says, this is my purpose, you can't just say, well, but by the grace of God, I... he's not going to go beyond his own purposes and call it mercy. Pastoral compassion, prophetic purpose can sometimes be at odds. Pastoral compassion and prophetic purposes can sometimes be at odds. The pastor wants to see you redeemed, but you can't make somebody listen to reason. And if they do what they want to do without consulting, that's evidence that their heart wasn't right or that they were a law unto themselves in some respect. All right? Unsanctified mercy. It gets us into the next one. It kind of leads into the next one. Number six, Jonah. Jonah's pride and judgmental pitfall. You know, most of you know the story. Jonah was told to go to that great city, 
But he had this weed seed attitude that we've been talking about of pride and a root problem of being too judgmental. He didn't even want to see the city repent because if they repented, then that would make him look bad. <laughs> Boy, how about that? Huh? While Moses was motivated by misplaced mercy, Jonah was motivated by too much judgment. Shut off with their heads. They deserve their heads off, God. Don't be telling them to repent and change. God's going to crush you. And then I want to be right when I say that. I want you crushed. I don't want you repenting. I want you crushed because I said that, and I want to be right. Because I'm proud. <laughs> he was more interested in seeing God destroy the wicked than seeing God would have mercy on them. You know, I always got a kick out of that in the church. Uh, you, you get your people that get in your face. They love to confront, and they, they say things like, I'm just speaking the truth. And I always go, where's the love? Because you speak the truth in love, right? And the Old Testament love commandment was in Micah 6, 8. I have showed thee, O man, what the Lord does require. Do justly love mercy. What we see in Jonah's case was loved justice. <laughs> Maybe do some occasional mercy, but not too often. All right? You can't switch those around. So there's a place for mercy, but there's also unsanctified mercy. There's total selfishness. All of these pitfalls end up being a form of selfishness one way or another. All right. So Jonah had the weed seed of pride and the root issue of being too judgmental. And how many people you know that are judgmental Christians and they, they can back it up with Scripture? They can always quote Scripture, but they don't quote to love the sinner and hate the sin. And Bless your enemies. Pray for them. You know, where's that at? Now, he had the character of flaw of being more concerned about his reputation than the people he ministered to. I believe there's going to be pastors that are going to have to deal with this in the days ahead because the church is not going to be popular with the world, is it? Never was, never will be, but it's even worse now. So... Do you care more about your popularity or do you care about the integrity of the Word of God? But the, uh, the emphasis right now is, remember we talked about the Johnson uh, grass mixture of selfishness, pride, anger, vengeance, self-will, personal ambition. <laughs> That's the weed seed attitude. Progressive Christianity. They're going to run from any assignment that might make them look bad So how can I, I even remember that John Vivier telling us a story about it, going to a church, and they said, don't preach nothing negative, no sin. We want to be positive here. Well, if you've got to maintain your ministry like that, you know, I, I don't want to be there because you who teach are going to be held to a stricter judgment. Eli's wicked children, they're like spoiled children. They want to be boss. Remember, some of you had grandchildren and say, what was, it, what was it little Joe said? That was funny. Dad said, I said no. She turned around. I said no. When you have a two-year-old, <laughs> you might have to deal with that down the road somewhere. <laughs> well, and I can remember, I can remember yours, granddaughter, when she was just a little little girl. You're not the boss of me. When you're two or three years old, you're telling somebody you're not the boss of me. You're living in La La Land. <laughs> okay, that's not for real. Because guess what? That's when the parent is supposed to say, "But I am, and I'm responsible to be the boss of you." Don't give me that. You're not the boss of me. They want to be the boss of God is the problem. <laughs> uh, I'll quit if you don't do it my way. That's why you, in, in training and discipling people, sometimes you have to tell them no, because you see if they quit when you tell them no. And if they do, good, because they're going to have to learn something some other way, because that way didn't work. God will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. You want to go a harder way, he can teach you. 
Unless it's not done, you'll find out. If I do this, then you have to do that. Do you ever have anybody bargain with you? What, the way Jennifer taught the, uh, the, the girls to pick out clothes. You don't give them too much of a chance to say no. You don't say, honey, do you like this dress or that dress? You like this dress? Don't give them a chance to say yes or no. Say, which one do you want, this one or that one? Give them a choice and then let them pick. But you can actually increase your problems giving opportunity to say yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. Would you like green beans or spinach? <laughs> That'll get a rise out of some of those little guys. Huh? <laughs> He's like, do you want green beans? No! I mean, that would come so natural and so easy. Make it at least a little bit more difficult. Or you can just let them blossom as they are. Free range kids. I'll do that if they do what it is. Oh, how about this one? It's not fair. I used that one as a kid. Oh, it never worked. It's not fair. Life's not fair. Get used to it. The fairness doctrine has to be delivered from your life because the rest of your life is not going to be fair. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, I was going to get to this later, but uh, J. Edgar Hoover, he said, this goes way back. I think he was a Christian, because people have quoted him on a lot of good things. So I don't know. But J. Edgar Hoover basically said that the uh, one of the signs of a juvenile delinquent is the one that thinks society owes him a living. Wow, we've got the potential for a lot of <laughs> juvenile delinquents based on that criteria, because that is rampant in the, the government owns. The government owes me. The society owes me a living. So I can be lazy, and some single parent, some woman who is a single parent could go out and work three jobs to pay taxes so that you can live back a life of ease. You're lazy. It's sinful. There's a blind spot for you, lazy and sinful. I deserve better. Oh, we'll get to that one later. But this immature believers uh, allow God, they have to allow God to mature them because he, he's got their best interests. But self-promotion, desire for popularity, Selfish ambition, other ungodly character flaws. And the sad part is there is no record scripturally that God ever used Jonah again. That judgmental pride and anger. He loved himself and his appearance more than what God called him to do. Number seven, Achan. Aiken and the, that's my ministry syndrome. <laughs> or selfishness and greed would be the character problem. His sin was to take uh, garments and gold, silver from the conquered city of Jericho and hide it in his tent. And we know that that did great damage. Uh, the sin was especially serious because it had directly said that all gold, silver, bronze, iron be devoted to God's treasury. Oh, it's like people say, I don't tithe. Oh, yes, you do. Everybody tithes. Just the question is, where is that first 10%? Who's your God? Where does it go? There's your God. There's your idol. That's who you really worship. Also, everything included all humans and animals were to be killed and then destroyed. And Achan did just that. So he and his family were stoned to death and then burned and covered up with a heap of stones. Mm. A new place is a dangerous place, isn't it? You know, Ananias and Sapphira, whenever God's bringing in something new, the judgment got stricter, didn't it? When God was dealing with Achan, it was, this was a time for something new entering in. And God, we're entering into something new in the church. God is, is purifying, and he's bringing through a remnant through the fire. Now, 
Uh, Aiken's weed seed attitude, of course, was selfishness and me and mine, and I don't respond to anybody. We had someone, well, no one will know, so I won't. We had someone in this church that came for a while, and their statement was, I don't submit to any pastor because I'm a prophetess. Whoa. It took many people down the tubes, and we've watched it affected places well beyond this church in a negative way. That attitude does not win. I don't submit to any pastor. I am a prophetess. There it is. Self-promoting, disregarded direction given from any leadership. They were a loner, and they had no concept of team ministry, no, no concept of working together with others. Most of the root problems would be eliminated if believers had the proper perspective on God's purpose for our position in the church. We would become interdependent rather than independent. Interdependent rather than independent. Now, number eight, the Judas pitfall. They owe me. The outward sin of Judas was betrayal of Jesus for money, yeah. But he hoped that following Jesus would fulfill the dream of position and power. He had his own vision, his own dream. And it wasn't God's. It was that if I stick close to this Jesus guy, then I'm going to get what I want. Mm. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that when I found out someone was basically following me in my first church only because they knew that I believe Dennis is going somewhere and I'm going to get on his coattails and then I'm going to take over. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Most people knew it and would come up to me, but I wanted to redeem, see them redeemed. But most people come up and say, you know, they just want to take over, don't you? Hey, if they can take over, they can have it because, <laughs> because I have whatever God's given. No. But they owe me. Uh, you see, pride is an exalted sense of self-importance convinced uh, to pull away from Jesus to serve themselves, right? That's what Judas did. When this, uh, the Judas spirit starts in seed form with the desire to be rewarded immediately for every service rendered. And so you find out little by little, you've got to take credit for anything good that happened. Even if somebody else did it, you have to take credit for it somehow. Uh, they owe me. I deserve better. I should be recognized more. I should be honored more. I owe it. I've seen, I've had people in the church steal in the church because they, they actually believe they were owed it. Can you imagine that? They owe me. They don't pay me enough. They owe me. You do that at work, steal paper clips and stuff. After all, they can afford it. You, they owe me. That's an Achan sin as well as a Judas. Peter faced some same kind of problems. Number nine, the James and John syndrome. More zeal than wisdom, an uncurbed rivalry spirit. Remember James and John, they grew up to be sons of thunders, became apostles of love. So obviously they changed in the process. But when they started out, it was an uncurbed rivalry spirit. Uncurbed rivalry spirit. So Father, we just pray right now. In the name of Jesus, remove any unhealthy competition that's in our spirit. Competing with more zeal than wisdom. Emulation is what it's called in the work of the flesh. Emulation is an uncurbed rivalry spirit in religion or business. In Jesus' name, cleanse me of it now. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.